Well, grace and peace. Today we're kicking off a new sermon series called Rooted. And I have been working on this series for probably, well, since probably day one when I got here. And so I've been waiting for this day to preach this message and to preach this series. And this series called Rooted is all about the metaphor of trees and roots and fruit, which is all over the Bible. If you look at the beginning of the Bible, what do you see? You see the tree of life, right? We see the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We see the fruit. And then at the end of the story, what do we see? We see the the tree of life again in the new creation, in the new heavens and new earth. We see leaves from trees that bring healing to the nations. And then Jesus, right in the middle of the story, what does he do? He teaches parables, right? Parable of the fig tree, parable of the sower, parable of the vine. Paul, the apostle Paul in the church says the fruit, the fruit of the spirit from the tree is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, con- faithfulness, self-control, right? So the, we all agree the metaphor of a tree is all the way through the Bible, right? And so I think it makes a lot of sense for us to utilize this metaphor in our lives and in our church. Because let me say this to you today and suggest it to each and every one of you, whether you're in this building or watching online, is that you, your life is a tree, right? It's either a healthy tree producing good fruit or it's an unhealthy tree producing bad fruit, right? And us as a church, we are a tree. We are a tree and we're either a healthy tree producing good fruit that the world around us notices, the fruit of love, or we are an unhealthy tree producing toxic fruit into our world. We're either a healthy or an unhealthy tree. And let me say that the, the, um, the key to being a healthy tree is to have deep roots, to have deep, deep roots. The deeper the root, the more interconnected the root system is, the healthier the tree is going to be and the more that good fruit is going to produce. If you look at redwoods, right, the, like the tallest trees, Right? You notice interesting things about their root systems. They're all interconnected, right? They're all woven together. And so we see that these deep interconnected roots produce these beautiful trees. And so we're going to talk about that. We're going to look at this metaphor in two ways. One, which is very relevant to us today, is the idea that a tree with deep roots is able to withstand the storm able to withstand the wind. I I came across this awesome picture, if we could put it on the screen, of a tree and the entire uh, foundation of the tree was washed away in a storm. But take a look, the, the tree still stands because the roots are so deep, right? Almost the, all that sand was washed away, but the tree still stands. Don't you want to have that kind of life? That when the storms come, that you're able to stand. I mean, that's what, that's what the tree in Psalm 1 is all about. It's about standing in the midst of storms. We all know about storms, right? 2020 was storm after storm after year. You could call it the year of storms. You guys have been hit by one thing after another. We've been hit by one. We look, we look at our family and we reviewed 2020 and we're like, boom, boom, boom. And this is you guys, we all in this, right? And maybe you, like me, felt there were times when the wind blew and you almost were going to break, right? So the deeper the roots, the more we're able to withstand the storms. And and let's just face it, 2021 is going to be a year of storms also. And so we have to have deep roots. And as a church, it's the same, deep roots. But the other side of this metaphor is this idea that the Bible designs us as a church to reach out. The branches of our tree is to reach out to the world with love and to bear good Fruit. So we have this idea of withstanding the storm, being a healthy tree, deep roots so that we can withstand the storms that come away. But there's the other side that we are designed to bear fruit that others enjoy. And that's the fruit of love. So we want to be a good witness. So the deeper the roots as a church, the more we're able to reach out with love to the world around us. Amen? Um, amen? All right, just making sure there was actually people here because I was worried for a second. But uh, sometimes our root systems are not deep. Sometimes our root systems are shallow. Uh, And it's not surprising. We live in a desert, and it's hard for trees to grow in a desert. Spiritually dry, right? We're searching for water in places because we're so thirsty. And if we 
search for water in places other than Christ, then we end up with these really shallow roots that are built on things like money and built on things like sex and things like that, which, again, are gifts of God, but when we worship them, they become idols and they destroy our root systems. And so we have these real shallow roots, and when the wind comes, we're just knocked over. And our witness as a church, as we all know, our witness as a church is contingent upon our willingness to allow God to produce good roots, deep roots in us. And so shallowness and idolatry is the world we live in. We live in a desert. And so uh, the stark difference between a tree with root systems in the world versus a tree with root systems in Christ, it's night and day. And so we want to be that church that lives it. I'm super excited today. We're going to share uh, some uh, visuals with you, uh, a vision graphic that has been designed for Sandy Hook as well as a new logo and our new website. So I'm going to share those pictures in a second. But I have to be, I want to be faithful here is that the reason we're talking about roots isn't because I thought it would be a cool visual. Um, There's a scripture that's actually been one of my favorite scriptures of my entire Christian journey. In fact, uh, the church council would have noticed this on my resume. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. And I'd like to share this with you is the reason we're talking about this. And as I read this, I'd like you to notice verse 17 as we get when we get there. It says, and I pray, this is Paul praying for the church, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may experience, may have power. So we're going to, I really want you to notice that part. So verse 14, this is Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus. Ephesus was a letter, a general letter, so it was given to not just the house churches in Ephesus, but it would have been given to other Christians. It's a general letter. So Paul is praying for those churches, but really Paul is also praying for us. And this Paul, of course, is praying for us too. So for this reason, I kneel before the Father, for whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with his power through his spirit in your inner being so that the Christ so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know that this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more, let me say that again, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine, more than we can imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. And it's such a beautiful prayer. And the key center part in that is to be rooted and established in love. And that is Paul's prayer for us and for Sandy Hook is that we be rooted and established in love. That we would know and have the power and the knowledge to know how deep and wide the love of God is. Because when it all comes down to it, doesn't it all come down to love? When push comes to shove, isn't everything that we are about as a church about love? Your friends, what do they need to know about God, that God is love? When it comes down to it, our theology is a theology of love. In fact, if you look at John Wesley and all his writings, that's how he referred to what he taught, love. It all comes down to love. And so he wants, Paul is praying for the church to be rooted in love, rooted in love. All right, so without further ado, let's look at some pictures here. The mission statement of the church is what inspired our graphic in addition to this passage, it says, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. So in this mission statement, there's two parts of our mission. Number one, it's to make disciples of Jesus Christ. That's the, the part of the, uh, the mission that we do. We make disciples of Jesus Christ. And there's a result of that. There is the result of for the transformation of the world. To make, Jesus, make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. So the vision graphic that we have, which is about our church's future, Sandy Hook United Methodist Church, there's the bottom part, which is the first part of that mission statement, and that's to make disciples of Jesus Christ, which is the root system, the interconnected root system. This is what we need to do, is to have deep roots, and the result of this is the transformation of the world, and that's the, the cityscape, right, of Columbus, Indiana, where God has planted us. We are 
uh, we bloom where we're planted. We, God has planted us, so we are called to make a difference here. We're going to make a difference overseas and around the world, but God, if we don't make a difference here, we got problems. We have to make a difference here in our city. So our, our visual that reminds us is that we dig deep roots and we have a wide reach to reach our city. And because of this amazing uh, picture, we decided when we put the logo together, we wanted to take that root system and just do a simple modern root picture that allows us to, every time we see our logo as a church, we're reminded, deep roots, deep roots, deep roots, deep roots. We have to remind ourselves of that. So deep roots, wide reach to reach our city. And then our website launch today, it's the beginning of this. So we put our graphic on. So it's the beginning of our, our website. If you look at it, it's, it's great. It's a step forward. We got a lot of work to do. Big shout out to Paige, uh, who really helped me get this together. So we have a modern looking uh, website, We're really excited about that. And then you can click on there and it takes you to all the sermons and there'll be a lot of great stuff on there for the future. So I wanted to show you that. Now, our, the key to reason we're doing all this is, you know, the world is a visual world. And there are friends that need, your friends as well as people in this room and watch online, need to see a picture that describes who we are. And so those are, tr we're trying to figure out ways to capture that for us. And I'm super excited about us being a church that goes deep so that we're able to reach wide. Now, those root system makes a lot of sense with, sense with me, and I hope it does to you. But what about that idea of love? I mean, love is an overused word. So when Paul was saying being rooted in love, what did he mean by love? Well, that word love in Greek is agape, which is not I love coffee type of love. I mean, coffee is good, right? Anybody love coffee? Anybody love chocolate? Yeah, right. But when we say love, that's not the same thing as I love God or God loves me, right? I love my wife, but that's a different type of love than the love that God loves us with. And that word agape is best defined as cross-shaped love, cruciform love, love that looks like a cross, love that sacrifices. And so for us, when we say we're rooted in love and everything boils down to love, we want to make sure we understand what love is. And love is sacrificial love. And probably one word that I would like to use to define love is the word radical. The, the love that we are called to love with is a radical love. And you might be thinking, wait a second, radical, that's a, that's a funny word. You could, that could be a bad thing too. And absolutely it could be a bad thing. But it's funny that the word radical means rooted. The word radical means rooted. It comes from the, lattice, the Latin word radix, where we get radish. So when you say radical, what you're saying is that you're rooted. And so Paul's trying to say us, don't, have, don't practice just normal kind of I love candy love. Go deep and love the type, with the type of love that Jesus loves us with, a sacrificial love. So I want to... I wrote something down that I'd like to put on the website is to say that the kind of love that we talk about here, our theology of love, is that we are a church that preaches, teaches, and lives a theology of radical, sacrificial, inclusive, peaceful, unconditional, transformative, holy love. That's who we are. That's every sermon, every Bible study, and the way that we learn life. It all comes down to that radical kind of love that God loves us with. So when we say rooted, and in the next four weeks, we're going to talk about different roots that God calls us to, maybe different values that God calls us to. We're going to talk about each of those in the form of a radical love. So what does it mean to be rooted in love? Well, today Jesus gives us a great picture of it in his baptism. Jesus shows us how to be rooted in love by his baptism. And so we're going to talk about that for a few minutes. The big idea for today is this. Everything that Jesus did... He did with the knowledge that he was God's beloved son and that God was well pleased with him. I'm going to read it one more time. It's, it's so amazing. Everything that Jesus did, he did with the knowledge that he was God's beloved son and God was well pleased with him. For Jesus to be rooted and loved means that he understand that he was loved by the Father. In other words, his belovedness, being the beloved son of God, was his identity that he took with him everywhere he went. When Jesus, the next place that he goes after this in the story is he went to the wilderness. The Holy Spirit took him to the wilderness. What happened? He was fasted for 40 days. He was hungry. He did not have chocolate, right? 
and he fasted for 40 days. He was hungry, and he was tempted from, by Satan. And what did he have? What did he, could he hold on to? He could hold on to, regardless of what was happening around him, he could hold on to the fact that God loved him completely. He was God's beloved child, and God was well pleased with him, regardless of what was happening in this moment. In other words, it wasn't that he had to be more or he had to be greater or better looking or have more money, that God loved him before his accomplishments. God loved him because he was his son, and that was the identity he took with him. When he was um, betrayed by one of his inner circle friends, the 12 disciples, when he was betrayed by Judas, and he went through this, I can't believe, he held on to the identity of God. When he was, when he heard the words from his fellow Jews, crucify him, he knew that God loved him. No matter what was going on around him, he knew the belovedness of God was his identity. When he was, when he was, on, uh, when he was beaten and scourged, and when they were pulling the hairs out from his beard, he knew that he was the beloved son of God. He knew it. When he was beaten so bad, skin was hanging off of him. He knew he was God's beloved son and God was well pleased with him. When he was spit upon and mocked and the crowd was crown was put on his head and blood streaked into his eyes, he knew he was God's beloved son. He took that identity everywhere he went. He knew, regardless of how this came out, and of course he knew how it was going to come out, but in that moment he knew he was God's beloved son. When he was crucified and hung on a cross and his lungs, he suffocated. He knew he was God's beloved son. And when his body was crushed and the blood was spilled out, he knew he was God's beloved son. He, that identity was what he held on to all the way through. And he received it in his baptism. He received it in his baptism. And we, as disciples of Jesus, we know that we are God's disciples. And through our baptism, we know that Jesus loves us, that we are God's beloved child. Every disciple knows their true identity as God's beloved child, and every other illusion, every other identity is an illusion. That we know that God is for us and not against us. That's what it means to be a disciple. So at the baptism of Jesus in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, Jesus was baptized, and as he came out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove, and Jesus heard the words that he was the beloved son of God and God was well pleased with him. That was his identity. He was baptized not because he was sinful. In fact, he was sinless. He was perfect. The reason he was baptized is because he wanted to be with us. He wanted to show solidarity. So Jesus got in line to be baptized. Now, I don't get in line anywhere if I don't have to. I hate lines. I hate lines. Like Walmart, I do uh, grocery pickup because I don't want to wait in line, right? I don't wait in line anywhere if I don't have to. I order on Amazon and have it delivered. I don't like to wait in line. Jesus intentionally went in line to show solidarity with us. He waited in line because he was one of us and wanted to show us that. And as he was baptized, the heavens ripped open and the Holy Spirit like a dove. And as we talked about last week, the descending of the Holy Spirit is the same Holy Spirit that hovered over the waters in creation, this brooding, birthing type of spirit that brings things to life. And this Holy Spirit anointed Jesus as King, as Messiah, as Lord. And uh, Jesus heard those words. And it was the greatest words that he ever heard. And it's the greatest words that we can ever hear. In fact, the trajectory of Jesus' life and the fate of the entire world, world hung on those words. Not words of a father who was celebrating Jesus' achievements. No, the words were from a father who just loved his son completely. And so what's the significance of our baptism? If we know Jesus' baptism is where he heard those words that he held on to for his entire life, what is the significance of our baptism? In fact, I brought our baptismal font or fountain here to the front to remind us about baptism. So what is the significance of baptism in the United Methodist Church and in our lives? If you look at baptism in the United Methodist Church, it is more than a symbol, it's a sacrament. So God saves us in one way that we 
kind of testify to that salvation is through believer's baptism. And, and that is when we experience the water, then we experience a sacred moment. And that sacred moment, because the Holy Spirit is present, it can be transformative. It can be incredibly meaningful and significant. Um, I was baptized as an infant. And then I reaffirm my baptism as an adult. I can't remember my baptism. But as an adult, I reaffirmed my baptism. I wasn't baptized again. I just said, hey, I don't remember that first baptism. Let's do this symbolically so I can remember my baptism. So what is the significance of baptism? Well, there's several, and I'm just going to throw them out real quick. The first is cleansing, cleansing. Um, in fact, baptism before John the Baptist, uh, all the baptism that took place up until Jesus being baptized was a baptism of cleansing. It was Gentile people becoming Jewish. So in a way, uh, Gentile people got the Gentile cleaned off of them so they could be cleansed and be Jewish. I mean, it's really what it was for. So it was really weird, this baptism that John was doing and Jesus was doing was different. So it's cleansing and, and for the church, it's an entry into the church. So those who are being baptized as infants or children or teens and adults, it's a welcoming into the church of God. In fact, uh, a lot of baptismals are, are put at the front of the church when you walk in the doors as a symbol of that's the entry point into the church. So you're baptized into the church, into the family of God. But then also, when you take a look at the significance of baptism, there is an element of exodus. Paul talked about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2. He talked about baptism was like being uh, going through the Red Sea. You were, being, um, you were escaping Egypt and slavery, and so you're becoming free. And so when you're baptized, you're recognizing, in fact, in the baptismal vows, it's a rejection of evil, rejection of Satan, rejection of false allegiances and idols. So in the vows, we proclaim that Jesus is our king and him alone. And so there's an exodus from our own life. In fact, in times of Jesus, most people who were baptized, they lost their family, right? Families rejected them. Their old life was gone. You know, if you were one of those wacky Jews that became a Christian, we don't want anything to do with you. We'll disown you. And that's what it's like. Now, it's not like that here. Praise the Lord. We don't lose our family necessarily when we become Christian. Some people do. But in the time of Jesus, that's what was going on. So there's the exodus from our old life into our new life. And then Paul says in Romans 6, he talks about, he talks about a baptism as a resurrection, and so, like, when you're baptized in, with immersion, you go down in the baptismal tank, and that's like going down in a coffin, and then when you come out of the water, you're resurrected, you have a new life, you're death to life. And so Paul talked about that in Romans 6. And then Paul talked about empowerment. When we receive the Holy Spirit or a baptism, we're empowered to do what God calls us to do. So there's a power. But the primary purpose of baptism is to receive our identity to receive our identity as a beloved child of God. Do you remember your baptism? Like I said, I don't remember my original baptism because I was baptized as an adult. Do you remember your baptism? I, when I went on sabbatical in 2016, we had seven weeks off, and I spent the first week in a monastery in Kentucky, one of the greatest weeks of my life. It was a silent monastery. So this introvert was in heaven because I didn't have to talk to anybody, right? It was amazing. And the extroverts were dying on the inside because they couldn't talk to anybody for an entire week. But it was great for me. Um, but after I came back from the monastery, we visited a church. We decided to go to a different church. And we went to the Episcopal Church uh, for the remainder of our sabbatical, which was in a neighboring town. They didn't know who we were. And we walked in the first Sunday. And uh, we walked in, and we were uh, behind a lady, and the lady walked into the sanctuary, and the first thing that she, know she saw in the aisle, the first thing we noticed was this baptismal font. And uh, she walked up to the baptismal font, and she dipped her hands in the water, she stirred the water, and then crossed herself. And then she went and sat down. So I just, I didn't know what that was, so I just walked past it and went and sat down. We all did. And so afterwards, uh, you know, the whole ser service, I'm sitting there going, why did she do that? What's the purpose of that? And it, the tradition I was raised in as Nazarene, there was none of the, this liturgy stuff. So it was very confusing to me. And so I talked to the priest afterwards. She was an awesome lady. 
And we sa I said, what was the deal with the, the water and the baptismal? Why did she do that? And, she, and the priest said, she said, she was uh, stirring the waters and remembering her baptism. She was remembering that she was God's beloved child. And I said, does that mean that every week when she comes into church, she was remembering her baptism, she remembers her identity? And she said, the priest said, yeah. I was like, because I don't remember my identity. I forget. I watch television and I forget my identity, right? I get, I get busy into work and projects. I forget that I'm beloved, God's beloved child. He's well pleased with me, regardless of how good this project or this sermon is. I forget my identity. But at this church, they remembered their baptism. They stirred the waters. And I said, every week. And then the priest says, and this blew my mind even more, not just every week, just not every Sunday, every time you wash your hands, you remember your baptism. Every time you take a shower, every time you go swimming in a pool, any, every time it rains, you remember your baptism. Any time you experience or see water, you remember that you're God's beloved child. So that happens all the time. So I don't have to forget my baptism. I don't have to forget my identity. I can remember it. But if we just leave it to the world to tell us who we are, we get something different, right? The world tells us you are what you do. You are what you produce. Jesus says, no, no, no. You are my beloved child, and I'm well pleased with you just as you are. Uh, the world says this, you are what you experience. Jesus says, you are the beloved child of God. The world says, you are what you know. God says, you are the beloved child of God. The world says, you are what you know. You are who you know. And then God says, no, you are God's beloved child. I'm well pleased with you. The world says, you are what you own, your stuff, your cars, your house. God says, no, it's not about what you own. You are my beloved child of God. The world says, you are who you raise, how good your kids are. Jesus says, no, you are the beloved child of God. The world says, you are your past. You never can shake your identity from your past. Jesus says, you are the beloved child of God. That's your identity. That's who you are. So the big idea is that everything Jesus did, he did with the knowledge that he was God's beloved son and God was well pleased with him. That was the key to his life. Jesus knew his identity. He knew that God was for him and not against him. And every disciple of Jesus knows our true identity as a beloved child of God. Every other identity is an illusion. A disciple knows that Jesus, that God is for us and God is not against us. Sandy Hook United Methodist Church, all my brothers and sisters here today, let me share with you the greatest words that you'll ever hear. You are God's beloved child, and he is well pleased with you. That is your identity. God is for you, not against you. If you make love your root, your life will produce amazing fruit. And when the roots are deep, there is no reason to fear the wind. You are God's beloved child. So what next step? is God asking you to take today? In order to determine your next step, and here's some questions. How deep are your roots? How deep is your love? Have you accepted your identity as a beloved child of God? Maybe today, one thing that you can do practically is you could get a post-it note and write, I am the beloved child of God, and he is well pleased with me, and put it on a mirror, your bathroom mirror, so you see it as soon as you wake up, um, and you can say it to yourself, I'm a beloved child of God. Or maybe you need to take a post-it note and put it by your coffee maker. See, that's what I need to do. And be reminded I'm a beloved child of God. Maybe some of you need to take a thousand post-it notes and write it down and put it everywhere you ever go, in your car, wherever you feel stressed. Be reminded of that. Maybe some of you need to take a picture of your post-it note and send it to somebody to let them know that they are a beloved child of God. Maybe you need to take a picture of your post-it note that says, I am a beloved child of God, and post it on social media. But make this your next step. Accept your identity as a beloved child of God. Maybe your next step is, do you need to be baptized? Maybe that question determines that. Maybe you need to reaffirm your baptism. Let me know if you need to be baptized for the first time or you want to reaffirm your baptism in front of your church family. 
Maybe today you need to remember your baptism. You need to stir the waters of your baptism. Remember you're a beloved child of God. What if Sandy Hook United Methodist Church would be so deeply rooted in God's radical love that when people look at us, they see that love? What if Sandy Hook United Methodist Church and every person, every disciple that's a part of us would know our identity in such a way that we are a beloved child of God that every false identity that was thrown at us would not stick? They wouldn't define us anymore. Instead, love would define us as people. Not just any kind of love, God's sacrificial, amazing, holy love. Maybe today, the biggest thing that we can dream about is what if we are so deeply rooted in God's love that this storm that comes, whatever, whether that's tomorrow, today, tonight, next week, whatever storm comes your way, that you are so deeply rooted that that wind won't break you, that storm won't break you. This time, we, you, will remain standing because we know that we are the beloved children of God and God loves us so very much. It's not based on what you do or don't do. He loves you, period. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your love today and the call for us to be rooted. When the storm comes, when the chaos comes, help us to be so deeply rooted that we withstand the storm. Help us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we can hold to this identity as a beloved children. Let that sink deeply into us that we are beloved. We are more than just, I love you. We are beloved. That is our identity. We are loved. And help us to hold on to that in such a way that it shapes our future individually and collectively as a church. And now help us to remember our baptism. Help us to stir the waters of our baptism, remembering who we truly are. 